In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Today we commemorate the dedication, that is the consecration, of the two greatest churches in Catholicism, that is St. Peter's Basilica and St. Paul outside the walls in Rome. On November 9th, we celebrated the the greatest of all of the churches of Catholicism, which is St. John Lateran, and that is the Pope's Cathedral, because the Emperor Constantine gave to the Pope in the early part of the fourth century the Lateran Palace, which became his residence and also the place of his Episcopal See and Church and that today is known as St. John Lateran, also the Basilica of St. Savior, one of the very few churches in the whole Catholic Church that has two names. It is dedicated both to our blessed Lord, St. Savior, or the Holy Savior, and to St. John the Baptist. <clears throat> but today we celebrate the dedication of two other basilicas in Rome, St. Peter's and St. Paul outside the walls. There are seven major basilicas in Rome. The four greater ones <clears throat> are St. John Lateran, St. Peter's Basilica, St. Paul Outside the Walls, and St. Mary Major. We celebrate the dedication of St. Mary Major, also known as Our Lady of the Snows, on August 5th. Then there are three others of lesser importance, the uh, Basilica of the Holy Cross in Jerusalem, St. Sebastian, and St. Lawrence outside the walls. These are the seven basilicas that you visit during the Holy Year. And if you make a pilgrimage on foot all around Rome, and it, is, it, it would comprise about three or four miles, all of that, uh, you uh, obtain great indulgences. So those are, that's the famous pilgrimage of the Holy Year. <clears throat> Constantine, in addition to giving the palace to the Pope erected two basilicas, those of St. Peter and St. Paul. St. Peter's Basilica rested upon the tomb of St. Peter, and St. Paul's rested close to the place where St. Paul had his head chopped off and where the remains of St. Paul were buried. The original Basilica of St. Peter, built by Constantine, became decrepit in the late 1400s. And that is why Pope Julius II, in the early 1500s, undertook to build a new basilica. So the old one was raised and the new basilica was built. It was started in about 1507 or so. It was not consecrated until the 1630s. So it took over 100 years to complete that basilica, and even then there were decorations still being made inside. And then the Basilica of St. Paul, built by Constantine in the early 300s AD, was demolished by fire, gutted completely, uh, in 1823. And the popes thereafter rebuilt the Basilica of St. Paul in exactly the same style, as the original basilica, but made it much more beautiful and enhanced it a great deal. So everyone said in seeing the second basilica that it far exceeded the first one. St. Peter's Basilica was erected on the Vatican Hill. Now there are seven hills of Rome, as you may know. The Vatican was not one of the famous seven hills of Rome, but it was a hill across the Tiber called the Vatican. And that's why it's called to this day, the Vatican. And there was an ancient pagan cemetery. And in this cemetery, St. Peter himself was buried. Now the cemeteries at that time were like streets or little paths, and they would build up uh, sepulchers. They would, you would see like a wall about 10 or 12 feet tall, and they would insert the bodies into these sepulchers on the side. They did not actually bury them in the ground. And Constantine, against all pagan sacredness, we might say, against all the rules of the pagan religion, 
buried all of that and erected the basilica right upon the tomb of St. Peter. Now, Pope Pius XII had all of that dug out underneath the foundations of St. Peter's Basilica. And you can get down into those, those foundations and you can look straight ahead of you at the tomb of St. Peter and then up, you look up and there is the main high altar of St. Peter's Basilica. And so that means Constantine chose exactly the right spot to place the altar, that is the church resting on the foundation of St. Peter the Apostle. And he also altered the slope of the hill so that the hill would be a proper setting for the basilica. So if you have ever been to Rome, you see that the, the, you have to walk up to the basilica. There's a slight incline. And that was done by Constantine in the early part of the fourth century, the 300s. And he also built the, the Basilica of St. Paul, as we said. <clears throat> now, when we celebrate the dedication of a church, <clears throat> we are celebrating the sign of life of the Catholic Church. Whenever you see a beautiful church, or even a little one, you say to yourself, this is a sign of life of the Catholic Church. People had to to sacrifice in order to build this. And many times you see these churches rising up in neighborhoods where the homes are very modest. I'm thinking of an example in Milwaukee where the Polish actually bought the post office in Chicago and had it moved to Milwaukee piece by piece and built this magnificent building. And then you look around the homes surrounding it, they're very, very modest, which means that those people sacrificed and sacrificed in order that they have a beautiful house of God. That is a sign of life, it's a sign of devotion, it's a sign of faith, because you don't open your wallets for that unless you believe. And unless you love God. A church means that she has drawn a sufficient number of faithful to herself and that God has moved these faithful in their generosity in such a way that a magnificent edifice can be built. It's the first thing you think about. You look at the art and architecture and you marvel at all of the work and thought that went into those buildings especially the great cathedrals. They are testimonies of people's faith and devotion. Now the church's edifices, although they are only buildings in themselves, nonetheless tell a great story about the faith and devo devotion of the people and of the devotion of the priests who brought these things to completion. In that building of the church, Milwaukee, for example, the priests, running out of money for it, went around from door to door asking the people to please donate to finish the building. And the building of a church is a sign of the church's success in preaching the gospel. And in many cases, it is the fruit of the blood of martyrs. And the building of a church is a sign of the church's ability by the help of God to rise up from the ashes of nothingness and even of persecution. Think of the churches of Rome. Think how much the church in Rome was persecuted in the first three centuries. And yet you go to Rome today and about every thousand feet you see a magnificent building testifying to the glory of God. Now the building of these basilicas mark the beginning of Christian civilization. Referring to the two basilicas in Rome that we celebrate today, Constantine used state treasury funds to build these buildings. 
This is a significant fact, for it shows the public recognition of the Catholic faith. Eventually, as a result of this public recognition, paganism would disappear. And in the 380s, Theodosius I, just about 60 years after the building of these basilicas, someone's lifetime, he outlawed paganism, outlawed Judaism. All false religions were outlawed in the empire. The only religion recognized was the Catholic religion. And this state of affairs would continue until the French Revolution. Now that means that it doesn't mean that pagans or Jews were put to death or anything like that. It means that the, the state would only recognize a single faith, and that is the Catholic faith. And the others were tolerated. Paganism didn't totally disappear in the Roman Empire until about the 500s. There were still people worshiping idols. So they were not persecuted or put to death. Jews continued to exist. But the only religion recognized by the state and supported by the state was the Catholic religion. That's very, very important. The French Revolution, and shortly before it, the American Revolution, implanted in people's heads the idea of religious liberty, understood in this sense, that the state should be indifferent to all religions and should and that no religion should receive a special recognition, and no religion should be considered false or true. The state is blind to religion, and that should be the way all states should be organized. That idea entered the heads of people. It comes from Protestants. It comes from people, uh, free thinkers, such as John Locke and other 18th century people who uh, denied the existence of God or very, came very close to it. And this idea was condemned by the Roman Catholic Church. Pope Pius VII, living in the early part of the 19th century, said this is, is going to destroy Catholicism, essentially. So that this attitude. Why is this so? Because it is contrary to the rights of God and the royalty of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is so simple. If our Lord Jesus Christ is the true God, if he is the redeemer of all mankind, then everyone should be on his knees before him, recognizing him as the true king and the true savior of all mankind. And everyone means not only individuals, but also nations. Because nations belong to man's natural law, that he organize himself in a nation and that the nation profess the true religion. It was unheard of in the history of the world that a nation should be indifferent to religion. No pagan nation in the history of the world ever was indifferent to religion. When the barbarians came into the Roman Empire, they said, well, of course we have to become Christian because the emperor is Christian. Some barbarians were permitted to come in by, by the Roman authorities. And it was unthinkable that you could be of a different religion from the religion of the state. That was the mentality of mankind because it makes so much sense. that the state as a, a collection, a, uh, an organized collection of individuals should also recognize the true God and the true king. Nonetheless, religious liberty is a dogma of the modern world. People would look at you funny if you said to them what I just said to you. What, are you crazy? because this idea that comes to us from atheists is ingrained in the modern mentality, even though it is simply something totally new in the history of the world, never thought of before, considered impious. Even the Protestants at the time of the, 
Declaration of Independence and the Constitution considered Jefferson to be an atheist because he wanted to establish religious indifferentism in this country. Even the Protestants thought it was blasphemous and thought him to be an atheist. That's how bizarre it was to separate religion from the state. Furthermore, the so-called indifferent state professes its own state religion. It's a paganism known as secular humanism, which is held to religi religiously by every liberal and which is taught and preached in public schools and universities and in Novus Ordo schools and universities. Diversity. Human beings cannot escape making some idea, some doctrine, their supreme idea and judging everything else in relation to it and they cannot escape making some moral teaching the supreme law in their heads and by which they judge everything else to be good or evil. So for example today you have climate fanatics and you have animal right fanatics and they are fanatics because they have raised what might be in certain cases a legitimate concern, namely that the animals are not mistreated or that we don't abuse the environment, up to a religion. And so, for example, when Bergoglio was accused of having promoted to, to uh, great honors a man who was well known to have seduced young men in the seminary to evil things. He gave a speech on the evils of plastic straws. Lest some whale choke on a plastic straw. That's what I mean by raising these things to the level of religion. and all he talks about is environment and the earth and all of those things, raising that to the level of religion. The other day he said that to gossip is the same thing as terrorism. Raising the ordinary things to the level of religion, that is, the, is the, the mindset of the liberal and the person who has turned on the true faith. And so, for example, diversity. In the French Revolution, they extolled liberty. And they said, no liberty for those who deny liberty. Thus making liberty the new dogma. And whereas they would attack the Catholic Church for the Inquisition, they themselves set up a guillotine for those who denied liberty. And the same thing is done today for diversity. The rainbow, diversity. Everyone should respect everyone else's beliefs and practices. But if you say, no, that's wrong, then you are the outcast. You are the heretic in the modern world. So the state really has a religion because men cannot avoid religion. Men cannot avoid making something their greatest and ultimate idea. Church buildings are representative of the Catholic Church itself. Each, that is the, the church, the Catholic Church as an organization, and the physical building, each has a visible structure. The physical building made of stones or bricks on the one hand, and the institutional church made up of the faithful and the hierarchy on the other hand. The faithful like the stones, are the matter of the church and the hierarchy endowed with the authority of Christ organizes and gives definition to the faithful 
linking them to Christ, the invisible head of the church. Likewise, the physical church is not merely a pile of stones, but it is a set of stones well organized according to the principles of art, architecture, and engineering. And this is what gives the church its being. It makes it to be a church, not merely the pile of stones. The Catholic Church, and particularly the Catholic hierarchy, derives its ability to rule the faithful from its intention to preserve and to promulgate the Catholic faith to the faithful in the entire world. In the same way, the church, the physical church, is consecrated to divine truth. And just as the institutional church would lose its reason for being if it did not preach, reveal truth, to the whole world. So the physical church loses its its reason for being if it failed to contain the truth and to preach the truth to the whole world. What is it except a museum? Go to England and look at, at the once Catholic cathedrals. Beautiful, beautiful churches. Meaningless things now. Meaningless. Big museums. I was in one of those churches not too long ago, and the Anglican divine, that means a minister, got up and to the tourists and said, we're going to now do something for which this church was built. And I thought, what's that, the holy sacrifice of the mass? And no, he said, we're going to say an Our Father. That church was not built for an Our Father. You can say an Our Father in your house, That beautiful cathedral was built for the holy sacrifice of the Mass, and it's the Protestants that stripped it out of it. And it's really sort of an absurdity now to have such a beautiful cathedral for something so banal as the Protestant service, not to mention heretical. Likewise, the physical building is anointed with holy oil. Consecrated churches are anointed by a bishop. The walls are anointed with holy oil. Consecrating it to the truth and consecrating it to the holy sacrifice of the mass. These buildings would lose their reason for being if they were not houses of truth or if the holy sacrifice of the mass cease to take place in them. Physical churches also manifest the four marks of the church. One, holy, Catholic, and apostolic. The Catholic Church is one in faith, in government, and in worship. So also physical churches are one in faith, the same faith in all of them. They are one in government in that they're all subjected to the Catholic hierarchy, one in worship in as much as the same holy sacrifice of the Mass takes place in all of them. They are holy. The Catholic Church is holy by its holiness of truth, by its holiness of worship, and by the holiness of its clergy and people. And so these physical churches are holy places, because of the truth in them, because of the sacred worship in them, the holy sacrifice of the Mass, and of the holiness of the clergy and people. And yes, it is true that in the church militant, there are sinners, and the church tolerates sinners in her midst. But that is a sign of the church's holiness. We saw in the gospel today that our Lord came to save what was lost, and that's why he went to the house of Zacchaeus. The church is not a club of the perfect, and it's a part of its holiness to tolerate the sinner and to bring him back. Indeed, the priesthood is made more for sinners than it is for the just. And so it doesn't detract from the church's holiness that it tolerates sinners. 
but in purgatory there are no sinners. Everyone in purgatory, the church suffering, is in the state of sanctifying grace. And in heaven there are no sinners. Everyone in heaven, the church triumphant, is in the state of sanctifying grace. So the church in the end, at the, after the end of the world, when the toleration of sinners shall be finished, will be a perfect church in which there is absolutely no sin, even tolerated. And the rest will go to hell and will be completely cut off from Christ for eternity. And the Catholic Church is Catholic, that is universal in faith and worship and government, and is found the same everywhere in the entire world. Before Vatican II, you could go to a church in anywhere in the world and you would find the same religion, the same worship, the same disciplines, everything exactly the same as you knew in your home parish. Even the same language of the Mass, everything the same. That's the Catholicity of the Church. It means one thing that is spread over many places and all time. And so churches, physical churches, are Catholic in as much as this, they contain this same Catholic religion, this universal religion, and that you can feel comfortable in approaching a Catholic church in any part of the world. And it is the Catholic church is apostolic. That is, the church is founded upon the apostles and it teaches apostolic doctrines, it has apostolic disciplines, and its authority derives from the apostles, ultimately our Lord Jesus Christ, but through the apostles. And so the physical churches of, of Catholicism have all of these characteristics. The apostolic faith is in them, the, the apostolic disciplines are in them, and they are founded upon the rock of Peter. And that rock of Peter is so, so bound up with his faith that they are inseparable. When, when was Peter called the rock? When he made his profession of faith. Whom do you say that the Son of Man is? Some say you're Elias, some say you're this. Whom do you say that I am? And Peter, speaking up, said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And our Lord said, Blessed art thou, Peter, because it is you did not, and I'm paraphrasing, you did not hear this from men, but from my Father who is in heaven. And then he said, And thou art Peter, meaning thou art rock. That's your name, rock. And upon this rock I will build my church. That means the church of Christ rests upon the foundation, the rock foundation of St. Peter. That is, he who is the possessor of the authority of Christ on earth. Whatsoever thou shalt bind upon earth shall be bound also in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose upon earth shall be loosed also in heaven. And I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. That means that if your church is not resting upon the rock of Peter, if your high altar does not have St. Peter's tomb under it, then your church is phony. It is false and fake, no matter how much it claims to be Christian, if it is not rooted in the apostle St. Peter, because he is the representative of Christ on earth together with his true successors. So just as if any of the marks of the Catholic Church, even one, should be absent, it ceases to be the true church. That's how we recognize the true church, by the four marks altogether. So also, if any of these marks be absent from a physical church, it ceases to be Catholic. It ceases to have a reason for being. And we look upon these churches and we think about this 
that our Catholic ancestors sacrificed a great deal in order to build these magnificent edifices. It was said of St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York that the little Irish ladies who worked as maids in the city built St. Patrick's Cathedral, the most magnificent edifice in the whole country. Back in the 1870s, these buildings were built for everything that I described so far, the truth, the holy sacrifice of the mass, sacred things, eternal things, apostolic things. And to whom do these buildings belong in the sight of God? Not in the sight of men, but in the sight of God. Don't they belong to those who still profess the faith, the faith of the ancestors who built them? Would not these ancestors be outraged to see what has happened to our churches? In Italy, I saw under an altar in Italy a, a, a sculpture of two men kissing. That is worse, worse than the statue of Venus that was placed upon the Mount of Calvary by the Roman pagan emperors because it is the abomination in the holy place, the repudiation of the natural law right in the holy place. Would not our ancestors be outraged to see such a thing, and outraged by the silence of those who are meant to protect us from those things, which is even worse? So these sacred buildings by right belong to those who are the heirs of the faith that built them. And we lament to see them used for all sorts of perversions today. And so our prayer should be to God, who can do all things and who can confound human beings in ways they don't even know about, that he drive from St. Peter's Basilica the heretic, the apostate, and from every other Catholic Church, and restore to us who believe what is rightfully ours. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.